are looking at the second part, which is the final part of the end of evidence, the end of the end of evidence. And the proof of that will be in the pudding when I don't do any more evidence lessons. <laughs> but the resurrected Jesus does appear to the disciples in the third, or I'm sorry, in the second. But to my thinking, the final of evidences, because there, this particular account is uh, from John is unique and in its character, the way that John's gospel is unique in its character. And so I think it's worth looking at it um, and seeing what is different about this because it is powerful as well. And it brings together several things that are witnesses to the resurrected Lord. We talked some this morning about the fact that he is, um, I guess, that he is seen by credible witnesses, eyewitnesses, and that happens here. But we talked as well about the fact that he is, uh, I guess, receives testimony from the Word of God itself, from the Bible, and also that he receives testimony from the miracles that he does. And the, these appearances incorporate all of these things, especially the last one. So, without further ado, we have John 20. It is verses 19 and 20. And um, in this place, the first appearance after the resurrection, rather simple, because that's how John does things. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he'd said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Um, the hands and the side. Um, perhaps you wonder why not the feet. Well, it is likely because the feet were, you know, in shoes. <laughs> they were covered. Um, in particular, the uh, the way they did things in ancient Rome, that went through the heel. So you would have to take the entire shoe off to demonstrate that. And yes, Rome were a bunch of jerks. That was a lateral laceration from outside to in through the heel. Um, as for the hands, you know, the Greek term for hand actually begins at the elbow. So anything forearm down is considered a hand. The uh, actual hand does not have enough tensile strength to support the human body. So it is uh, very likely that they um, use the wrist or between the uh, the two arm bones, uh, either of those would be sufficient strength to hold the body. Anyway, he could show this. The side was pierced by a broadsword. That's how they checked for death, and that would be an incision, I don't know, three, four inches across. So that'd be a pretty good, uh, pretty good mark there that he could show to the disciples, the men, these apostles. Um, but we see the doors are closed because they were afraid, which Mark also had recorded in 20 verse 8, or I'm sorry, 16 verse 8. <laughs> and Jesus came among them nonetheless and said, Peace be with you, and showed them these things, and they were glad when they saw the Lord. This is the first appearance. So, okay, there's your mechanics. There's the simple things, I guess. And John is like this. His cycles uh, are, rep, you know, the, he repeats a thing. And when he does so, he expands upon it. Every, every subsequent iteration is more and more complex, uh, wider uh, in scope. So that's the first one. However, there is a second. And if you're at all familiar with the Bible, you know the second overtakes the first. That happens all the time. Abel 
is better than Cain. Isaac, or I'm sorry, uh, Jacob is better than Esau. Uh, Joseph, or, uh, Joshua gets them to the promised land, not Moses. So many different times, the second overtakes the first. And here, the second overtakes the first. We read in John 20, verses 24 to 29, Thomas, one of the twelve, whom they call the twin, was not with him when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Now you may remember, if you are a student of Scripture, that when Mary Magdalene went and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, um, some of them didn't believe that. And the fellows to whom he appeared on the road to Emmaus told the rest, who also did not believe that. <laughs> and so, we, But in John's account, we have just the one captured where he appeared to them all, except for Thomas. Now they all tell Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But his response is, unless I see in his hands, probably forearms, the mark of the nails, place my finger into the mark of the nails, place my hand into his side, I will never believe. And again, the finger and the hand correspond to the size of the wound. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. So they're, you know, we have a pretty good setup for what's about to happen here. But notice what he says. Unless I see and put the finger in the hand, I will never believe. Now that's an interesting thing. He won't trust that Jesus is raised from the dead until he himself lays eyes on it and puts hands on it. And we find that again, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them <clears throat> and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Which indicates that yes, he now accepts that Jesus is resurrected. This is true. However, the response of Jesus is not congratulatory. He says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. An alternate translation that I would support is, you haven't believed because you have seen me, have you? That's what he's really saying. Blessed are those who have not seen and still believed. Now, when Jesus says this, of course, he's talking about us. But the thing is, if you want to be like Thomas, well, you'll never believe because you can't lay eyes on him and you can't touch him. When Jesus said this, what he meant was, this is the way faith really is. Thomas doesn't believe because he has seen and touched. That's not belief. So that's a rebuke. That's not congratulations. <laughs> he has more to learn. All right, but that's the second one. Now, the main event is the third appearance after the resurrection. So we get into this, and, you know, the third one is captured in John 21. And the 12th verse you know, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And we have also the 14th telling us this was now the third time Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So that's the three. Something that perhaps you have not noticed, um, at least I hope that you haven't, because that makes this more interesting for you, but... I had not noticed that this third one actually captures many things that have already happened. When he appears to them the third time, there are things, there, there are just, there are items present, you know, there are, there are things that happen, there are things that are said, all of which echo what came before in the Gospels. 
For example, the miraculous catch of fish. Now, I don't know whether this is big enough to read. I think it probably is okay for most of you. <laughs> I have, uh, well, yeah, I don't want to go too far afield, but typically I insist upon 60 point font. Uh, I think seven words on one line is about as much as uh, persons of low vision can actually read. So, as a rule, my slides are in 60-point font for that reason. But, um, there was no way to do that and fit these parallels in. So, this is a measly 36. <laughs> uh, so, sorry if you can't read them. It was the only way I didn't, I couldn't find no way to make a useful chart without just accepting that some of this is going to be small. Sorry. But we can uh, look at it together. Let's look at the miraculous catch of fish. So, in the account of John 21, what you really have, you know, Peter says, I'm going fishing. They say, I'm going with you. And they catch nothing. And then they see Jesus on the, side, on the shore who tells them to cast the net. And they catch a bunch of fish. And they come and sit down and have breakfast with him. And then he has a conversation with Peter. Um, so here we're looking at the miraculous catch of fish, which is Luke chapter five. So if you compare John 21 to Luke chapter five, you can see several things are similar. Here they are uh, in Luke 5, one on one occasion, the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God and he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. So that Lake of Gennesaret is the Sea of Tiberias and also the Sea of Galilee. It's, those are just different names for the same body of water. So you can call it uh, whatever floats your boat. In John 21, Peter said, I am going fishing, verse 3. They said, we are going with you. And they went out, got in the boat, but that night caught nothing. Over there back in Luke 5, verses 4 through 6, we have Jesus said to Simon, Put out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon said, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing. That's interesting. You notice that in Luke 5, we have, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. After he said, you go do that. Here in Luke uh, 21, uh, we see that they got in the boat, they went out, but they caught nothing, and it was night. They toiled all night and caught nothing again. So it's an interesting thing when you think about the fact that Peter was a, a, a fisherman to begin with, as was John, and Jesus has died and been you know, they, they've seen him again, but they don't know what's happening. So he said, I'm going to go back to fishing like we used to do before all of this stuff happened. Maybe it was just a dream, whatever. I don't know what's implied by what he's saying, but they're in some sense without Jesus, or at least without direction. When he shows up and says, hey, cast the net over there. <laughs> it was very similar. In John 21, he said, cast the net on the right side of the boat, you'll find some. And so they did. In Luke 5, Peter, <clears throat> Peter said, we caught nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. Right. And in John 21, the conclusion is they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And in Luke 5, they enclosed a large number of fish. So here, they can't get it in. There's too many of them. He said, bring some of the fish. And Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153. That's a large number. And they are large fish, too. And though there were so many, the John account says, the net was not torn. Whereas in Luke, their nets were breaking. 
So this is better. But it's interesting to realize that when Jesus appeared to them for the third time as a group, he appeared to them in the same way in which he had appeared to them at first when he called them to be apostles. And he did almost the same miracle in the same way. And just as that woke them from their stupor <laughs> to come and follow Jesus at the time that they were called to be apostles, so also it is awakening them from their stupor after he died and was resurrected and they didn't know what to do. There's another thing that happened. <clears throat> Peter went overboard, as was his usual. <laughs> Peter, you know, uh, Petros is a stone, a stone or a rock. Um, you know, very likely he was a big dude, athletic dude. You know, kind of a, um, a guy that works, you know, with his hands. <laughs> but anyway, P Peter goes overboard. Um, in John 21, Simon Peter, on hearing it was the Lord, put on the outer garment because he had been stripped for work. And uh, threw himself into the sea. John 21, 7. So he went into the sea to get to Jesus. In Matthew 14... When they are, again, on the lake, the same lake, in the middle of the night, Jesus came walking on the sea, 25 to 29 record. And when the disciples saw that, they were terrified, said, this is a ghost. But Jesus told them, no, it's, you don't have to be concerned about this. But the 34th verse, when Jesus says so, uh, Matthew 14, 34. Peter answered, Lord, if it is you, come, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. So it's an interesting thing. They're seeing something walking <laughs> on the lake. They're thinking this is some kind of a phantasm, a ghost. This cannot be real, which is what you would think if you saw a dead guy walking around and you knew who that was and you knew he was dead but here he is it's very similar isn't it and they would say is that really him is that really you so this is a similar account there's another account in john 6 where jesus is again on the sea of galilee sea of tiberius and told them, feed this crowd, <laughs> 5,000 people. To which they replied in John 6, 9, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And Jesus said, have them sit down. We'll take care of this, right? But John 21, 13, Jesus came, took bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. Because when they got when they got to shore, they realized that he had bread and he had fish. Again, he had the men sit down in John six, five thousand of them. He took the loaves and, having given thanks, distributed the loaves to those who were seated. So these a few loaves were distributed to 5,000 grown men, not to mention the women and the children. But it's interesting to note, he took the loaves, he gave thanks, he distributed it in John 6. In John 21, he came and took the bread and gave it to them. In John 6, so also the fish. In John 21, 13, and so with the fish. And these are, you know, this is before the times of uh, cut and paste. They didn't have cut and paste on scrolls. <laughs> so it's telling you 
this happen too, remember? That, that's what's going on in this third appearance of the Lord to his apostles. He's reminding them, you remember how I called you? Do you remember how you walked on water to get to me? Do you remember the loaves and the fishes? How many baskets of fragments did you take up? That's what's happening. And uh, one that I think is, is fair, you may disagree with me and that's all right. Um, there is charcoal, charcoal fire. I think it's fair because we are getting to the point here that Peter is the focus of John 21. Not because he's the first Pope, but because <laughs> he denied Jesus and is still around. The other one who denied Jesus is dead. John 21, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And when they would finished breakfast, Jesus said something to Simon Peter. Okay, so this charcoal fire is there. It's morning. Um, and the Lord is going to have a talk with Peter. First time since the last time they talked, where Peter said, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And yet he did deny him and did not die with him. If you remember, that was John 18. 17 to 18, the servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also aren't one of his disciples, are you? He said, I'm not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves and Peter was with them standing and warming himself. Well, on the John 21 side of things, <clears throat> it turns into this conversation between Jesus and Peter where he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he replied to Peter, feed my lambs. There's a lot more to this conversation, which is uh, maybe its own lesson. I will try to summarize it quickly. Uh, there are two words for love in this passage. There is one that is agape, or, well, the agape love, which is uh, selfless love. Agape love is selfless, sacrificial, um, the kind of love that uh, a soldier has who sacrifices himself for his group, his battalion, whatever. That's called agape, or the kind of love that a parent has for the child. The other kind of love here is uh, phile, which would be uh, a friendship kind of love, a kinship kind of love. It is still a love, but it's not that idea of sacrifice. It's that idea of friendship, kinship, you know, um, you talk about a bibliophile, that's somebody who loves books, right? Um, somebody who has a, a kinship, a, a fondness, you know. It is a love, but it's not sacrificial, particularly in its focus. The two words for love appear in this conversation. The first time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love agape me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love phile you. The Lord said, do you have sacrificial love for me yet? And he said, you know, I have only friendship love. What's between the lines there is Peter saying, I let you down. You know, I did not sacrifice myself. That's what's being said. And the same two words on the second time when he said, do you love me? And he said, oh, you know, I love you, but it's first it's sacrificial love, then it's only friendship love, non-sacrificial. You know, I'm not willing to sacrifice. You know, you know that I failed. 
The third time he's upset, not because Jesus asked him three times in a row, but because Jesus said in the third time, do you love Philae? As in, is that all you've got? Peter, are you really telling me you're not ready to sacrifice yet? That's what he's, that's what is actually happening in that conversation, okay? And we'd have to go through a lengthy uh, teaching to get there, but you know, that's about your three minute summary. So at the end of this conversation, the conclusion that Jesus reaches is this, truly I tell you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Right? When Peter was young, remember, he cut off the ear of one of the servants. And when they ID'd him, positively identified him there at the charcoal fire warming himself while Jesus was being given a mock trial inside, he denied being a disciple. Right, so when you were young, you did what you wanted. When you are old, you will not be escaping death. That's what is being said. Which is what he said to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. <laughs> Which is back to our original. Follow me is what he told them when he first appeared to them in the boats, when they first pulled this miraculous catch of fish in Luke 5. Remember, follow me. So this is starting over for Peter. And it's good. Because we all need to start over. point of these things, again, is that when Jesus appeared to them the third time, <laughs> that appearance captured, you know, the original calling of the apostles, the miraculous catch of fish. It also captured Peter walking on water with uh, Jesus walking to them while they were at sea. It also captured the feeding of thousands with the loaves and the fishes. It also captured the betrayal and Jesus' full knowledge that he was betrayed. The, ro the rooster crowed. He knew. He knew ahead of time that was going to happen and did it anyway. All of this is pointing to the scripture bears testimony to him. The miracles that he does, including the one that he did after, you know, in this particular chapter, 21, bear testimony to him. And now you see that the thing that's being done is codifying everything that came before. No pun on cod. <laughs> wow, I've cast a wide dragnet here. I hope nobody's offended by this humor. But um, it is really uh, something that's happening there. It represents all that has been done. It represents all that came before. And I would argue, uh, which is definitely an entirely different lesson, but <laughs> I would argue that that's the point of the revelation. John's revelation in the same way is quoting from all the books of the Bible and retelling everything in a spiritual way, yes, symbolic way, but that's what it does. It's codifying the things that are, in fact, the Word. But here John tells us in the conclusion of his Gospel in 25 of John 21, there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, and I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. There's so much that he did that we couldn't possibly write it all down. And, you know, somebody might say, well, this is uh, classic hyperbole. And 
I've, I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, don't exaggerate. Right. Um, no, it's not hyperbole. What he's saying is, <laughs> just like the way that he does the iterations, and they move from very simple premises to more complex things to even more complex echoes, but they're all the same subject matter. <laughs> this is what he means. It never stops echoing. The scriptures comment on themselves over and over again. The patterns repeat over and over again. It's like, um, it's like a fractal. <laughs> you know how the fractal repeats itself. Eventually you get back to the exact same shape. It's kind of, it's really cool, actually. It's a cool thing in mathematics. But it's, that's what the Word of God is. It's a fractal. There's so much detail, and it goes down infinitely, but it never actually changes the substance of what it is. It's an amazing thing. This is what he means. We can continue these iterations, and they can get bigger and bigger and more complex, and it will just keep going. That's the nature of God's Word. And that's true. But this also, you know, uh, I guess to repeat myself, this also is the end of evidence. God is the one who did this. When you put things together in this way, uh, when, you know, the capstone of his appearances to them post-resurrection is this. <laughs> and it encapsulates everything that had been done among them. All of the accounts that we have read just rolled into one, all of these themes compressed. This is divine in origin. Man did not come up with this. God did this. So, no, you know, if you want to know something about biology or archaeology or geology, you know, you're going to have to talk to a scientist about that. What does that have to do with God and his word? Mm, nothing. Nothing. They're not related. They're different disciplines for different purposes. But if you want proof of God's word, well, you're not going to get it from science. You're going to get it from the word itself. This is the end of evidence. Jesus is resurrected. There are many and valid, very strong witnesses to his resurrection including the words themselves the works that he did but the words themselves which we still have which still echo like john said that they would uh, the magicians in pharaoh's court kept providing these kind of paltry imitations of the of the uh, plagues you may remember at some point they gave up though when Pharaoh asked them to reproduce it, they said, we can't do this. This is the finger of God. <laughs> that didn't matter to Pharaoh, though. He was just looking for an excuse. Um, but when they said, this is the finger of God, I mean, that's what we're talking about here. Man didn't do this. This is obviously divine. That's the nature of it. And that's the evidence for it. And that's the end of evidence. That's what we need. That's what produces faith. All right. So, that's also the end of the end of evidence. And the end of evidences. We're done with that series. So, <laughs> close the book on that one and um, continue on um, open fellowship in the new year, the Lord willing. Um, by all means, if you have additional comments or questions on this or any other topic, let me know. If you have requests, I do take requests. I do not do weddings and bar mitzvahs. But I do take requests, so uh, if there's something you're interested in in the Bible, I'd be probably interested in that too. If today you are not a Christian, become a Christian that you might be forgiven before God that you might have an answer to give when God wants to know what you have done with the blessing that is his word 
the blessings of life that he has given us, demand that we return to him thanksgiving and praise, which we do in our songs and in our worship, as our brother prayed earlier. It is true. A good prayer. Um, we, indeed, are living the life of Christ daily, and uh, you can really only do that by becoming a child of God. If there is today within you the realization that you need forgiveness, we can help you to be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of your sins. If, on the other hand, you are already a Christian who has been forgiven in time past, but in some way have not been living right, let us help you with our prayers on your behalf that you might be brought back into the fold, that you might be forgiven by him, that we might be encouraged by you and vice versa. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let that need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song select.